Hello everyone, thanks for being here today. My name is Brandon Ballanger. I'm an artist and a biologist, and we're here at the Acadiana Center for the Arts as part of my exhibition called The Age of Loneliness, which is happening right now through January 8th. And we're standing in front of an installation that I started to work on in 2010. Um, being here in South Louisiana, it's really important to remember some of the things that have happened in the past so we can avoid them in the future. In 2010, we had a giant oil spill called Deepwater Horizon. And it's the largest oil spill in human history, we think. Um, certainly the largest one in modern times. And it was leaking out um, hundreds of thousands of gallons, uh, 200 million gallons of oil in the course of a few months. And so that oil had to go somewhere. And it went into the Gulf of Mexico, which is an incredible biodiversity hotspot. So if you've not heard that word before, biodiversity literally just means biology, like biological organisms and diversity. And the crazy thing is we don't usually think about it, but the Gulf of Mexico is kind of like our Amazon rainforest. It's filled with tens of thousands of creatures at any given moment. There's upwards of a thousand species of fishes living in the Gulf of Mexico. So when that big oil spill happened, um, myself and lots of other folks were very concerned about not only the human life that was lost, but the, the wildlife that was impacted. So in response, um, some friends and I, some collaborators and I created this installation, which is called Collapse. And it literally is 26,000, a little over 26,000 preserved specimens. Um, there are over four or over 370 different species. And to give you an idea about that biodiversity in the Gulf of Mexico, if we had another 97 of these, that's actually just what we know, but we're discovering new species all the time. So as a, as a budding artist or a biologist, one of the amazing things that you could do in the future is probably go to the Gulf of Mexico and discover new species. So as you kind of see in the installation, there's different tiers. And what the tiers represent are more or less like a trophic or a food pyramid. We don't always use that term trophic, but in science, that's the way we describe the food web. So at the beginning of the food web, there are lots of little critters and plants and, and, and organisms that make up the base of the food chain. They're producers. They're ones that are absorbing sunlight and transferring that into sugar and other nutrients for some of the other organisms to then eat. There's other ones that are eating dead stuff and recycling that energy so it works its way back up into the food chain. And so the piece kind of represents that. And specifically, we wanted to, to talk about and be concerned about what happens when all that oil ends up in such a biologically rich environment and how it impacts the food, food chain, or it could. So part of the, the goal with this project was also not just to raise awareness of that, but also just to get people inspired by all that diversity. Um, so since you can't see the piece in person, uh, I wanted to show you a few of the specimens. Over here, there's this really great creature. It's called a guitar fish. I nicknamed that one Jimi Hendrix. Um, the guitar fish is really neat because it's kind of a, it's an ancient group of fishes that are called cartilaginous. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit. But cartilaginous fishes include sharks and rays and skates. So in this case, you have a, it's a type of shark really that is kind of the link between rays and skates and sharks. So very flat feeding on the bottom. Um, right next to it is another very, very ancient fish called a sturgeon. So it's also a type of cartilaginous fish. And both of these guys predate the dinosaurs by millions and millions of years. And even right here, we have a critter that dates back to even before that. It's a deep sea isopod. I like to call her Fluffy. That's just a nickname. She's not really all that fluffy at all. But really what it is, it's a it's when you see a roly-poly or a pill bug, these are their great-great-grandparents that have lived in the ocean since the trilobites, so since the, the Cambrian over 500 million years ago. And they're still alive in the Gulf of Mexico today. 
which is part of what I wanted to make this art about to inspire people about the life there. But for today's class, we're not going to focus too much on the trophic pyramid, but what I am going to talk about is how we draw some of these great creatures and then talk a little bit about their evolutionary story. So when we get upstairs to the classroom, I'm going to show you 500, mil 500 million years of evolution in less than four minutes, or at least that's a plan. We'll see what happens. And I want to show you one other body of work while we're in here, which has to do with uh, a process called clearing and staining. And that's going to be a little bit about the drawings that we're going to see upstairs too. So come over here for a second and join me. All right. So I wanted to show you this body of work. It's called Ghosts of the Gulf. And it's also related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill because these were um, specimens that I found uh, and other folks found during and after the oil spill. And I did this thing, they were, they were already dead, I preserved them and then I cleared them and stained them, which is a chemical process. And what it does is it's a way so that it's not an x-ray, it looks like an x-ray, but I'm actually staining different types of tissue. And so the blue is cartilage, the kind of bluish green is cartilage, like the stuff that we have in our ears and our nose. And the red is calcified tissue or bone. So what we really see a lot here is how some of the fish have these really, really interesting anatomical designs when it comes to their fins and their vertebrae, their backbones, and how other fishes like this ancient ray have very little calcified tissue. It's mostly all cartilage. So these ancient fish are called cartilaginous fish. And we'll look at some more of those as specimens upstairs. But this is a great way so you can kind of see the difference between fishes like rays and skates and what are called bony fishes, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And some really cool ones like this armored pancake batfish where its whole, it has almost, its whole skin is like an exoskeleton uh, designed to protect itself from predators. And I'll show you a, a preserve one of those upstairs. So, just on this wall, you can see over 300 million years of evolution of different species. And fishes are so important when we start to think about biological diversity, not only in the Gulf of Mexico, but all over the world. For animals with backbones, they are by far the most successful group. There's over around 35,000 species that are currently identified, and that's more than double all the birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians combined. So they're considered an ancient group of creatures. They're masters of adaptation, which we'll talk about a little bit more upstairs. And they're still changing and evolving and doing really amazing things right now. And they're adapting to many of the, the climate changes that we see and habitat changes that we're finding. So they're a really important group for us to study right now. Hi, I wanted to show you, since we're gonna go upstairs in a few minutes and start drawing fish, and other specimens, I wanted to show you one of my fish drawings. So this is a really cool critter that's endemic to the Gulf of Mexico, meaning it's a species that's found in the Gulf of, no of Mexico and nowhere else on the planet. And it's called a high fin blenny. And the way that I created this is I saw a preserved specimen like this in Washington DC in the Smithsonian collection. And I drew it by sketching it first in pencil and then I went back through with different materials. In this case, I actually used crude oil, like oil from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and another spill called the Taylor Energy spill, which is ongoing. And I literally used crude oil paint as a medium. But I'm just gonna show you how to sketch. I don't recommend using crude oil as a medium because it never dries and it's toxic. But I did wanna show you um, one of my drawings that I turned into a painting. And then you could also use one of your drawings to turn into a painting with watercolor or other materials if you want to. All right, I need to show you all another really interesting group of specimens. And uh, this group predates the dinosaurs by millions and millions and millions and millions of years. These little critters, they are animals, even though they're very, very plant-like, they're called tunicates. And this group was the first group way back millions of years ago before any critter had any backbone that started to have what is called a chordate. So the beginning of backbone started with these beautiful creatures like this. So we could say we're talking about our great, 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 great,
but they're still alive today. So before, just imagine before there were any critters that were like free swimming with a backbone, this is what gave rise to them. And we'll show you a little bit more of their ancestry upstairs. All right, hello. So welcome back. We're now in the art room. And like I promised, I'm gonna show you 500 million years of evolution in less than five minutes. It's actually closer to six. When we start to think about how different uh, the world would have been before humans were here and before dinosaurs and before animals with backbones, there was this great thing called the Cambrian. In the Cambrian, it was like the age of giant bugs. But giant bugs not living on land, but giant bugs living in the ocean. And that's when you get amazing creatures like trilobites and literally this thing called the trilobite explosion where just thousands and thousands of bugs occupied the earth, including like giant sea scorpions and all kinds of stuff. And then at some point in the Cambrian, you get these really weird critters that start to show up like the tunicates we saw downstairs. The tunicates are also called sea squirts. And they're really important because as I said, they start to form this like backbone, this chordate. And you get another weird little, those guys, they, they, they are sedimentary, they stick on things. But these guys, it's probably hard to see, but it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little creature called a lancelet. And a lancelet is really interesting because it's also a pre-vertebrate, like a pre-chordate type creature that's still found today. And so these date back, hundreds of millions of years and then the next big explosion you actually start to get critters like this beautiful hagfish isn't she gorgeous so these guys are wonderful they're scavengers the tunicates were filter feeders these are filter feeders suddenly now you have critters that have more advanced anatomy and they're fil they're they're smelling things they don't have eyes they've got a skull but no backbone and you can see they've got these beautiful little like tentacles um, they have little jaws for grinding. They eat dead stuff. So this is about 550 million years ago. And then the next advance, which happens about 50 million years later, you get gorgeous creatures like this. So this is a lamprey. And look inside. Look at those great teeth. So this is literally a parasite, right? Isn't it great to know that we come from a long lineage of parasites? Some of us more than others. But anyway, um, this lancelet was a bloodsucker and they're still found here so 500 million years old these have eyes they start to have fins a skull and a backbone and then this crazy thing happens uh once again 50 million years later now we're at 450 million years ago something happens with the, the gills so these are breathing all of these critters so far they're breathing underwater Right? They've got gills, which are the, 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 anatomy, or the, the organs that fishes have to be able to directly absorb oxygen from the water. Some of those gills over time adapt and become jaws. So then you have creatures like that beautiful guitar fish that we saw downstairs and this little shark. So can you imagine? This adaptation from being a scavenger, from being a filter feeder to a scavenger, to a vampire or a parasite, to suddenly what can you do with jaws? You can crunch things, right? So you can break up, you can defend yourself. So this causes this explosion. This is a cartilaginous fish like we were talking about with the skates and the rays downstairs. And so once this happens, it's an arms race. You've got fishes that are feeding on invertebrates like those trilobites. And so this is about 450 million years ago. And then the next big adaptation that happens is cartilage becomes more calcified and you get this explosion of bony fishes, which by far are the most successful group of of animals with backbones that have ever lived on the planet. So already 400 million years ago, we're seeing an explosion. So this is a fossil, a fossilized bony fish, and just all of this adaptation, I'll show you in a few minutes with other bony fishes, but suddenly you've got scales, you've got gills, you've got spines, you've got the ability to eat things, um, to swim away very quickly to defend yourself, and then an odd thing happens one of these groups become lobed fin fishes and the lobed fin fishes it's probably hard to see this these are critters that they're now at this point we're talking about about 365 million years ago you have the first amphibians that give rise from what we think lobed fin fishes so you can kind of see this is a fish 
but it's breathing air. This is a South American lungfish. There are four species still alive today, but they're in this really interesting ancient group, which uh, gave rise to animals with fingers and toes and limbs and the ability to breathe um, air. So, like I said, about 500 million years of evolution in five minutes and 12 seconds. Okay, so I just wanted to show you this kind of a very tiny little assortment of some of the diversity in the Gulf of Mexico when it comes to fishes. I mean, just, just look at the shapes and the colors. I mean, a lot of the color fades out with preserved specimens, but still you can see patterns and stripes and, and textures. And these are all amazing critters. And there's, there's so much neat adaptation that happens with so many of them. For example, um, this is an amazing fish. Everybody, most of you have probably had flounder before or sole. When these critters start off, they actually look like a normal fish when they're babies and they have eyes on each side. And as they're um, growing, one eye, they start to flatten and one eye literally goes Can you imagine? Imagine how difficult growing up is for humans. Can you imagine going through that when you're in like sixth grade? Anyway, the point is what an incredible creature. So they can camouflage themselves. Um, they're plentiful in the Gulf of Mexico. Unfortunately, the, the southern flounder seems to be declining a little bit. We have to pay some attention to why that's happening. Uh, this beautiful creature, a moray eel, also like an amazing predator. A great story of adaptation. This is uh, what's called a short big eye. There is a normal big eye. This is just a, another species that's called a short, short version. This is in the, the Scorpinidae family. It's a type of sculpin called a short fin sculpin, but it actually has venomous spines. And they're very good at um, camouflaging themselves, living in rocks, and they're sit and wait predators. So another little fish comes by and then gets gobbled up by these guys. And then on this side, I mean, you have this beautiful creature. Isn't he just adorable? Um, this is a frogfish. They live in sargassum, like in seaweed. And it's really cool. I don't know if you can see it. I'll try to point it out. There's a tiny, tiny little angler here. They're in the angler fish family. So it uses this little thing. It doesn't glow in the dark, but it wiggles around to attract fish or other smaller things. And then it'll gobble them up. And then it uses these. Look at that. It's a fish that basically has hands for climbing around in seaweed. So this is um, really part of the point is to think about how these critters have adapted. I mean, you've got fish with feet and hands for climbing around in seaweed or fish like this one. This is um, a type of batfish where you can really kind of see, uh, this is a spotted batfish. Look, it's basically got feet for walking on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. This one's really cute. It's a pancake batfish. Don't you wish that was your nickname, Pancake Batfish? But this is the one I showed you downstairs that's had all that red, all that armor plating. Um, many of you probably recognize this group. It's in the pufferfish family. This is actually called a, a striped burfish, but when it's in danger, it puffs up, and it's got venom in these spines to protect itself. Um, this is a remora, or a shark sucker. And so it's got adapted a special appendage for, for swimming along. So it's using very little energy because it's, it's using the energy from other creatures that it'll attach onto, including boats sometimes. And then it's kind of scavenging and eating smaller um, fishes and, and crustaceans um, living next to a shark. This one's really cool. It's a parrotfish. Unfortunately, parrotfish in life have lots of color. Um, when you catch them, often they'll say, Polly, want a cracker? That's not true at all, I'm just joking. But they do have beaks like a parrot and bright colors. You can see right there, they're, they're coral eaters, so they feed on coral. So just a little bit of the diversity, and what we're gonna try to do now is take one of these wonderful things and try to sketch it out. All right. So the, the next part of our project is uh, we are going to do a little bit of sketching. So what I, uh, we chose here, this is a beautiful spotted moray eel. Um, and the first thing to do is to kind of get it out of your mind that you have to make a drawing that's perfect or that it's supposed to be super representational. It's really more about like looking. So think about it. This is a critter 
that lives deep underwater. It makes a cavern. It feeds on other fishes. It's adapted to have these huge teeth. It's adapted instead of scales like so many other fish do to have a really rough or really thick skin because they do battle each other. And of course they are preyed upon by larger species. Um, they've got these great adaptations. So instead of just fins in certain areas, they have a fin that runs this way as well as down here. So they're really kind of like underwater serpents. So incredible like to think about that, the way they're swimming, the way they're feeding, and they have a great regenerative ability, meaning like if they're injured, they can heal really, really well. Um, so the, one of the other things is the science side of this, we can actually measure this. This is a really neat thing called calipers, and you can get these on Amazon for like, this is, I think these were like $5. Now as a scientist, one of the things is when we're studying um, fishes and other organisms, insects, we take measurements. So they'll often be like, you'll go from uh, eye to snout. So we can see that that's 258 millimeters, right? And then we do the same thing. You can do it with different parts of the body. You can do right down here is what's called the cloaca. That's the Latin word for sewer. I'll give you an idea of what comes out of the cloaca. Um, I'll let you guess. And often we would measure the snout to the vent is what it's called and from the vent to the tail. So we could literally do that using these calipers or if you wanted to just practice, you can just use a regular ruler that you get anywhere. And one of the things is when you're drawing, if you want it to be very, very precise, you can actually measure it here and then measure it out. But in our case, I want it to be just a little bit more free flowing. So I'm just gonna kind of just start by sketching the mouth a little bit. And what I try to do is when I'm sketching, I like to go really, really light. So I'm just using uh, a type of, I think it's a, a design ebony pencil. I've been using these since I was a kid. So this is a happy accident. You had some of these here, <laughs> but you can um, buy these online. You can get them at most art supply stores. They're inexpensive. They're easy to use and they're very, very forgiving. So already I'm seeing, I'm making a few mistakes, but it doesn't matter. This is just an initial sketch and just kind of, you want to just kind of get that, that, that motion in there. And that's a fun thing when you start to see like how beautiful these shapes are in the fishes and how they've got all these crazy adaptations for surviving in really, really different types of environments. And I always say the best way to learn how to draw is just to do it. Don't listen to other people's techniques necessarily. I mean, there's great pointers out there, but really draw because you want to and you want to learn and you want to look and just don't be worried about the way it looks. You know, um, there's also different techniques. Some people sketch really, really quickly to almost kind of get the movement. Well, that's a little bit what I'm doing here. So that tail went off a little bit. I see I'm gonna run out of paper, but that's okay. But I love that, that shape that comes across. Such a beautiful, beautiful species. And then kind of put in where the eye is. And then they have gills. One thing I wanted to mention is, I know these species that I'm showing you, all these specimens, they must seem terribly exotic. Right, so where in the world are you gonna get more eels? Well, there's a few um, collections if you were interested here in Louisiana to go visit. LSU has a really great preserved fish collection in Baton Rouge. There are preserved specimens also on the UL campus. Um, I'm more than happy if you all come out to, my wife and I have a little nature reserve called Atelier de la Nature. My son and some friends are working on building their own natural history museum there. So you'll be able to come out and visit there. If you're a little closer to New Orleans, Tulane University has the largest preserved fish collection on the planet. Um, so you can make an appointment to go um, work out there. Or if you want to just go see or tour or make sketches out there, you can do it. Another thing you can do is just go to a seafood market. So go to Delcom, 
go when they're bringing in the, 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 fresh, the fresh shrimp and the fresh specimens. You can buy specimens there, sketch them out, meet the fishermen, talk to them, talk to them about what they're catching and see what they have to say about the different species. It's really, really fascinating and we're so, so very fortunate to live in a part of the world where we have such an amazing access to the biodiversity in the Gulf again. Not only do we get to eat them, but we also get to study them and, and learn about them and sketch them. So, so what I've done here is just a really quick gesture. Right? So um, if you had other art supplies now, like if we were making like one of the oil paintings, what you could do is literally start to go back in with some of the um, undercoat. Like if we're making a watercolor, just go back through with light coats of brown or whatever. And the tricky thing with this fish would be that spotted pattern, right? So how in the world do you get those spots? Well, one of the things you can do is just when you're making the watercolor, if you were to go through and make it into a watercolor, just as you're painting, just imagine all those little tiny circles. I had, um, we were doing this last week with a group and somebody was drawing these little tiny circles and they drew like hundreds of those little circles, which was really special. <laughs> but you can kind of get a sense of it. Uh, another thing you can do is the public library system is really, really super. And if you don't want to work from actual specimens, you can just go get amazing field guides that have really, really great drawings in them. So I've got some of those books right here to show you. So this is just one on um, shark skates and rays. I know this is in the Lafayette library system, a field guide to coastal fishes. And look, I mean, beautiful illustrations and a great way like if you don't have an actual specimen if you just wanted to um, to go back through and re represent these artworks um, you know all of those field guides but maybe what you could do is also look up things online if you if you can't get to the library by yourself so anyway i'm just going to sketch in a few more things and then I'm going to show you all what to do if you do get some specimens from a seafood market and you don't know what to do with them. After you draw them, what do you do? Well, you could eat them, um, I suppose. Or if you want to keep them in a jar for a really long time, I'm going to show you how to do that next. Okay, I think I'm going to leave that one there. And we'll move on to preserving a specimen. All right, y'all. Well, um, we're going to do a final little project here. And the idea is increasingly artists are using preserved specimens in their work. Scientists and biologists have been doing this for centuries. Natural history collections date back literally to the Egyptians and maybe even earlier. So what I'm going to do is show you really quickly how to preserve a little bit of seafood. So what we've got here are some arthropods, right? So these are some little gray shrimp. Uh, and I've got a couple of small fish and the, the thing is as a biologist if you wanted to save these for centuries you would use uh, this material called formaldehyde or formalin and that's really toxic so we don't want to do that at home but there is a simple thing you can do at home which is literally just getting your your specimens either from a seafood market or go catch some yourself if you want to um, sometimes when you get shrimp at a market they have little bycatch with them and literally what you do is you just need to find a nice jar that seals up really well and just take your specimens after you've been drawing them or doing whatever, examining them. There's some really neat things like the pointy rostrum on these shrimp and they've got great eyes that have um, got these tiny little segments. So these guys have, are basically critters from the Cambrian and we just put them in. The next one we're gonna um, add a couple of shrimp. This was part of the bycatch. These are menhaden. They're also called uh, shad or pogi. If you ever heard of the pogi fishery, it's actually the largest fishery in the world is in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's for little critters like these. Um, if you were having a bigger specimen, this wouldn't really work. But for these small shad, this will work. And it's literally what you do is you just take rubbing alcohol, just your regular 70% or you can use 91%. And you just want to submerge them all the way so everything is covered and leave them for about a week. 
you can kind of stir them around to and just keep in mind this is regular old rubbing alcohol you can use isopropyl or ethyl alcohol um, keep in mind it's flammable right so you don't want to stick this next to an open flame or your gas stove or um, anything like that just make sure you're working with your parents to figure out where you're supposed to store it and literally you put the lid on top and you leave it sit for about a week and then you want to come back and what will happen is the alcohol is going to have some color in it it's actually some of the, the melatonin some of the pigment is going to leach from the fish and water and juices are going to leach into that alcohol just switch it out i just did that with these shrimp these shrimp have been done for about a week and what you see is they get really hard like really firm so they're kind of dehydrated from the alcohol and i just put them in another one i'll let that sit unfortunately the color is is different it's pretty but literally these will last for um, decades. So you can have this little, your own natural history collection that you can draw from or create art from. And uh, that's it. And then I'll invite you to come visit some of the great natural history collections we have in Louisiana at LSU. I mean, there's some specimens at UL you can go see. There's some at LSU and there's some at Tulane University. Um, so thank you all. And to just recap for what we did today, you got to see the exhibition here at the Acadiana Center for the Arts. Uh, you can come visit that uh, now through January 8th. Um, and then we did the specimen drawing and I encourage you all to continue doing that. And uh, I wanna thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you again in the near future out in Arneville to make some nets and go on a bug walk and stay tuned for the next virtual art studio. Thank you very much.